Legacy Build Spire monthly programming. We have lots of exciting things to share with you this year, so I hope you will join us for future events. My name is Nancy Kelly, and I serve on the steering committee and as a founding member of NYC Builds Bio. I am joined by my fellow founding and steering committee member, Mitch Simpler, managing partner of JBB. Want to say hello, Mitch? Well, I, I hope you can hear me because it's my mic and camera are, don't seem to be turning on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear oh, good. you. I know you're not missing any much if you don't see me. So uh, welcome, everybody. And, and I am very proud to be part of this uh, presentation and proud to be part of New York City Builds Bio Plus. Just wanted to welcome you all to our newest and latest installment of uh, New York City um, and our 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 emerging um, bio and, and uh, life science technology that's, uh, that's growing at uh, an amazing pace in New York City. So with that, Nancy, I turn it back to you and uh, get on with the show. Thank you, Mitch, really appreciate that. So I would like to thank Triumvirate Environmental for being the lead sponsor of this seminar series. And I would like to thank Taconic Partners, not only for presenting this afternoon, but also for sponsoring this webinar. I would also like to acknowledge the founding and corporate members of NYC Builds Bio who make this programming possible. We have a lot of new people joining us this afternoon. So I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to NYC Builds Bio for those of you who are just getting acquainted. We are the premier organization for real estate design and life science professionals. We connect the life science and real estate communities through events, research reports, and educational programs, both in person and online. NYC Builds Bio is a 501c3 nonprofit organization serving as the go-to place to find information about and assistance with growing, building, and locating life science companies in the greater New York metro area. We're excited to welcome all of you to the second webinar of uh, NYC Builds Bio sponsored seminar series with Triumvirate Environmental. This webinar is entitled Emerging Life Science Subclusters in the Greater New York Metro Area. It will focus on Midtown West and Long Island City subclusters in New York City. Our first webinar held in January discussed the impact of a recent NYC planning study of the greater New York metro life science economy on all of the subclusters in the greater New York metro region. It concluded that the New York metro area, which includes New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, enjoys the largest life science economy in the United States, and the 2020 census data shows it growing faster than many other regions of the country. You can find a link to that session on the NYC Builds Bio website. This seminar series will run for eight episodes from January through August 2022, each covering different life science subclusters in the greater New York metro area in more in depth. All of these subclusters are growing up around existing academic institutions and new private life science development in neighborhoods, which have distinct social, culture, and recreational flavors. The next seminar is scheduled for March 22nd, focusing on Midtown East in Manhattan and the Manhattanville District in Harlem. Registration is open, so be sure to sign up after this event to learn more and be sure to check out our website for other upcoming events. Before opening it up to our program today, let me just give you some information about the developing life science clusters in New York City and beyond. Asking the question, where is life science growth taking place in the greater New York marketplace? Well, just as happened in Cambridge, next slide please, over the course of the development of its life science cluster, a number of subclusters are developing around academic hubs in Manhattan, uh, flanked by two ground up development opportunities in live work play environments for millions of square feet of commercial life science space in 
Long Island City, and Jersey City. Next slide. The east side corridor consists of Mount Sinai, Academic Alley, Long Island City, Midtown East, Brooklyn, and Hudson Square, which is the nexus between the east and west sides of Manhattan. Next slide. The west side corridor, which stretches from the Bronx Hutchinson Metro Center down to Columbia Presbyterian in the north through Manhattanville, Midtown West, Hudson Square, and on to Jersey City. Today, we will learn about the subcluster of Midtown West, which includes three life science projects, Hudson Research Center at 619 West 54th Street, 125 West End Avenue, and 787 11th Avenue. We have the developers of those projects, Taconic Partners and Mount Sinai School of Medicine, together with their technical teams to discuss these exciting opportunities. Then we will learn more about the growing cluster in Long Island City. We will have King Street Properties discuss two new projects that they have coming online there. Before I turn it over to Triumvirate Environmental for introductions, I just wanted to cover a few administrative details. We have over 250 people registered for today. So please keep your cameras and microphones off during the program to minimize technical difficulties. There is a program in PowerPoint highlighting the hosts, sponsors, speakers, and content for the meeting. These will be posted on the NYC Builds Bio website after the meeting. The program is being recorded and will also be available on the website as well as the NYC Builds Bio YouTube channel. If anyone is having technical difficulties accessing the Zoom room or other technical issues, please email info at nycbuildsbio.org or send a notice through the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Since most of you are participating in listen-only mode, please feel free to submit your questions via the chat, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which is the chat button, and we will open up for discussion and Q&A at the end of the program and we'll address as many of your questions as we can. At that time, we will also have a chance for smaller randomized groups to meet in separate rooms where you can open your videos and microphones to talk to each other. You can stay as long as you like to get to know each other and share stories. Uh, and I see that someone has posted a link to the New York City planning report in the chat. Thank you, Matt, for doing that. Now I would like to introduce Alicia Anello, General Manager, New York Branch, Triumvirate Environmental, the lead sponsor for this seminar series. Thank you so much, Nancy, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alicia Eniello, and I am the general manager of Triumvirate's New York, New Jersey operation. Triumvirate has been the leading environmental health and safety service provider to the life science community going on 34 years now. From laboratory moves to regulatory setup, permitting and on-site support, including waste disposal. We've partnered with hundreds of life science companies across the country and helped them grow safely from their early stages in incubator spaces through to production and manufacturing spaces. It's been a real treat to witness some of their novel ideas come to life over my 15 years plus with the organization. Our success comes from our flexibility and the customization of our offerings to fill all EHS needs through one vendor that really leaves the researchers and the management companies even free to remain hyper-focused on their science and the success of their businesses. At the request of some of our longest clients from Cambridge, we set up locations in California four years ago, and um, we continue to service, this way we could continue to service our bi-coastal clients at a national level. With the excitement and growth here in our New York metro area, I thought Triumvirate could sponsor this series and place a spotlight on our area with our long list of life science clientele across the country as our audience. As Nancy just said, the potential for collaboration with the research hospitals and universities, along with the growing amount of space and funding being dedicated to life science here in the New York metro area, really makes our locale ripe with possibility. At the local level, 
Triumvirate has uh, had a full operation in New York City since 2003, including the only commercially permitted hazardous waste storage facility in the five boroughs. We are the only local resource in this market and having the facility puts us in the same seat as all of our clients. We're under the full scrutiny of New York City DEP, FDNY, and the New York State DEC. We've been providing EHS support and consulting, waste disposal support, and emergency response services even to some of the largest research institutions in New York City for over 20 years. We have 43 consultants locate, uh, local to the New York metro area and a fleet of just over 50 vehicles. We're already providing, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but we're already providing services to clients within the life spaces uh, that we'll be covering as part of the eight part series. Um, and um, we have clients in the buildings uh, that we'll be visiting today virtually. Uh, along with that tidbit and to let you guys uh, see my point of view from all the excitement, um, we've already had 12 laboratory moves scheduled for quarter one of 2022. Most of this is uh, folks graduating out of incubator spaces and finding new homes in larger spaces. So 12 in quarter one um, is a lot um, compared to what we've seen in previous years. On a personal note, I'm really glad that we're starting with Midtown West and Long Island City as our kind of entry episode. Uh, those are my neighboring neighborhoods. Our operation is located in Astoria, Queens, which is just a few stops away from Long Island City. And I am a recently new homeowner on the Upper West Side. So just a few train stops away from the Midtown West facilities uh, that we'll be covering today. So again, big thank you uh, to Nancy, New York City Builds Bio, for providing us the platform to spread the word. And uh, thank you to all the speakers here today and those joining us in future parts of the series. So take it away, Nancy. Okay, Carolina, next slide. So just introducing to Conic Partners to talk about their exciting projects in Midtown West. Hey, Carolina, you can go to the next slide. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matt Weir with Taconic. I'm going to just briefly um, tee this up for our team, uh, both Taconic team as well as some of our uh, design and uh, engineering teams, as well as our leasing team, who will uh, take you through the details of our uh, West Side assets. Um, if you want to jump to the next slide, please. And even one more after this, sorry. So just to tee this up quick, um, Taconic is a New York City based developer. We, um, as, the, as the slide here shows, have really developed, manage and operate a, a diversity of properties here within the city. But obviously for today, we're talking about life sciences. This is an area we are extremely committed to. We currently have four projects in various stages, including some future pipeline projects. But obviously, we're going to focus on two of them in the uh, Midtown West sub-market today. Um, we'll be taking you through not only the detail of those projects, but sort of the, the neighborhoods, the various uh, amenities that are located around us, and really a, a, a strong developing cluster on the west side, which, uh, which our neighbor in Mount Sinai will also be talking about. But... Um, just to kick this off, I'm going to uh, introduce John Schifrin from CBRE, who is our leasing representative. And then the, uh, the rest of the team will take you through the projects uh, in detail. And I guess before I, I kick it over to John, just one note. First, thanks to Nancy and uh, the team at New York Builds Bio, as well as Triumvirate. And lastly, just to, um, you know, we're, we're presenting, Taconic is presenting these projects today, but uh, we are developing, and I want to acknowledge our partner, Silverstein, for the Hudson Research Center, and our partner at 125 West End is the team over at Nuveen and LaSalle. So with that, thank you all, and uh, John, take it away. Thank you, Matt, um, and thank you, Nancy, and, and thank you to the, uh, to the Triumvirate team. Um, to Jonathan Schifrin, I'm the leasing agent over 619 West 54th Street. Uh, that's the kind of first project uh, that really uh, in, in my view, kicked off the uh, the acceleration of the life science space that we're seeing over the last couple of years, um, as well as 125 West End Avenue. Um, I run the uh, the agency leasing team for uh, for CBRE here in New York City. Um, we sit on top of uh, these projects as well as a couple of others. 
uh, and some other projects nationally. So we have uh, good insight into what's going on, not only in New York, um, but as well as uh, around the country. I'm going to flip to the next slide. And the next one. So just a quick market overview, and I know that Nancy touched on, on some of this, the, uh, the metrics that you're seeing on the screen. Um, Seabury, actually, uh, we, we just um, finished off our year-end 2021 uh, numbers. Our report should be coming out soon. Uh, so we do have an update uh, to the metrics that you're seeing on the screen, um, but impressive numbers all around for New York, I think, as a market um, that uh, is not one of the top life science markets. Certainly, um, we've got uh, top stats uh, across funding metrics, employment metrics um, that rival any of the larger markets like Boston or, or some of the West Coast markets. Um, if we look at the, the venture capital funding alone, 2020, we hit $906 million. Um, that number ballooned to 1.4 billion um, year in 21, uh, which was across 33 deals. So I think not only are we seeing an increase in VC funding, but we're also seeing um, an increase in the number of transactions um, that people are putting money into. I think a lot of uh, a lot of that increase is due to the uh, increase in the incubator space that we've seen over the last number of years. So we've got the number six down there for the number of incubators, 164,000 square feet of incubation space. That number is actually set to increase with some of the deals that happened recently, like Indie Bio and some of the other um, incubation expansions. Um, there's also an RFEI out for some more incubation space that the city's pushing. So. Uh, the early stage companies are thriving in New York. That's attracting a lot more venture capital funding. Um, and the fact that we've got some more life science space in New York, so that 2.5 million square foot number um, is allowing uh, companies to actually move in to space and operate successfully. A um, couple of other just metrics that aren't on the screen. Um, we did 433,000 square feet of life science leasing last year, which was also a record. Um, that number is up about sevenfold since we started um, six or so years ago in New York. Um, represents obviously a, a tremendous increase. Uh, we've seen this kind of year-over-year -year doubling uh, of leasing in the life science space, and already with the uh, the number of tenants that we're seeing in the market that are looking for space, um, that number uh, should hopefully double next year. Uh, so not only do we have more tenants that are in the market looking for space, something like two million square feet worth of tenants. Um, that, are, that are searching for space, but we also have more products for them to move into. Um, and more importantly, I think the other number that I want to point to is the availability rate for occupancy-ready space, uh, which sits at, at 3%. Um, that's been one of the key drivers of our market. Um, landlords, owners like Taconic, delivering uh, ready-built space for tenants to move into to capture them as they have their scientific and funding milestones. Um, Taconic did it very successfully at... 619 West 54th Street uh, with the first piece of space that was leased to Hybercell. Um, and that is also part of the plan for 125 West End Avenue, uh, which will be a full floor of pre built that deliver with the rest of the building in Q2 2023. Up to the next slide. In terms of clusters, uh, and Nancy, Nancy touched on them earlier. Um, most of the major clusters are, are really thriving um, from the east side cluster, Long Island City, um, Harlem, uh, and especially the west side, uh, I think in large part due to the building stock and the zoning regulations. I think early on um, when we started uh, working in the life science space in New York, it was a lot easier uh, to develop um, buildings that were in M zones. You've got a lot of that product up and down the west side of Manhattan. 619 West 54th Street is one of those buildings. That, that sits in an M zone. Um, and then on from that, with the connectivity to public transportation, as well as um, some of the hospital networks, uh, certainly the Mount Sinai West Side cluster um, has led to 125 West End Avenue, which is about 10 blocks north of, of uh, 619 West 54th Street. That building, um, for me, really represents something that New York City has not seen before, um, not just from a space perspective, but also from an infrastructure perspective. And I know that the, uh, the folks at Perkins and JBB are gonna get into that um, in a little bit, but the, the, the actual um, bricks of the building, the physical structure um, is more well-suited uh, for life science companies than um, many of the other buildings that exist, exist currently. Um, the other interesting thing that I wanna point to is uh, the 
transverse, the 65th Street transverse that goes across uh, Central Park, which I, I think is, is um, kind of an underrated um, feature of where our building is located. It's going to allow companies, uh, scientists, employees to get from the west side to uh, the east side. Um, we've actually uh, timed that. It's about a 12-minute drive across town, uh, which is significantly quicker than if you had to, um, you know, hop on a bus or, or go across town in a, in a taxi, which could take you 45 minutes in the middle of the day. Um, I think that that's going to ultimately lead to more collaboration um, between the organizations on the west side, on the east side, um, and allow companies to locate over in the west side cluster and not necessarily um, worry that they're so disconnected from the hospital networks on the east side. Hey, everybody. My name is Chun Lerng. I'm the asset manager at the Hudson Research Center. I've been with Taconic since 2018 and have been you know, working on the repositioning of the Hudson Research Center since uh, the very beginning. On the next slide, I will give an overview. It's located on 54th Street between 11th and 12th Avenues. It's 320,000 square feet. HRC is the home to the New York Stem Cell Foundation, Hybercell, and C16. Um, we're in the midst of completing a $20 million infrastructure project, uh, delivering all new mechanicals for the building up on the roof. Um, and then the seventh floor we're delivering in coming weeks, we'll have a 13,500 square foot uh, spec built unit that'll be ready um, very shortly. Perfect for uh, tenants coming out of incubators and graduation space. On the next slide, go through a couple of photos and images of spaces that we've delivered over the last couple of years. Um, this is the Hypercell space. I'm going to pass it to Matt Malone for just a quick overview on just design aesthetics and everything that goes on at HRC. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the space that uh, we often refer to as the Hypercell space. I think uh, something that Chun mentioned in terms of the design philosophy here that has really enabled this to become uh, a bit of a um, a successful project uh, as a whole has been that this is a space that was ultimately uh, preconceived or pre-built uh, as a laboratory space, a spec lab space, uh, similar to what Chum was just describing. Um, we were able to produce this build, the the space in such a manner that it met, you know, we 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 like to say about 75 to 80 percent of the requirements associated with most of the tenancy that we see, uh, and ultimately that enabled uh, the group Hybercell to come and take this space essentially as is. Uh, uh, with some minor modification uh, that they required uh, to make the space their own. But ultimately what that did was, which was incredibly uh, uh, helpful to them and, and, and made the space successful was uh, there was a much faster speed to market as a result of that potential opportunity uh, with the space being pre-built. What we try to do in here, next slide please, um, is to maximize the transparency uh, through the laboratory and into the office spaces. This shot in particular, you can see from all the way in the back of the space, we can see through to the windows at, at the far perimeter of the space. The idea was to maximize the transparency, one, for awareness and lab safety, but two, as well, to maximize daylight into the laboratory environment. Uh, laboratory environments are workplace environments for uh, laboratorians, and most people tend to overlook that, thinking labs need this enormous amount of light control, which they do want to have environmental controls, but it doesn't necessarily mean they want to be devoid of daylight or an awareness of the outside world. Next slide, please. Thanks, Matt. Um, but yeah, these pictures that we're kind of showing right now are representative of the spaces that we're delivering. You know, the seventh floor space, that's 13,500 square feet that we're delivering in the next couple of weeks. Just a lot of light and air into the space. Uh, flexible, modular, as Matt alluded to earlier, you know, best in class infrastructure, everything that's above those ceiling panels, you know, you'll be able to plug and play and it's moving ready for any kind of life science tenant that's growing out. Yeah, thanks. I agree, John. This is this is what's great about this. Again, what we tried to do was uh, uh, embody that kind of uh, entrepreneurial spirit that a lot of these uh, graduation scale tenants have. The idea of that, uh, you know, garage uh, entrepreneurial spirit, uh, the space itself having something of a warehouse feel uh, that was its original function. Uh, so we tried to embrace that. We tried to run with that as a kind of a uh, the blending of, of, you know, you've come into your own, you're creating your own space, but in addition to that, you still have that uh, that hunger, that entrepreneurial spirit. So there is this blending of uh, a little bit of polish and refinement with that uh, loft-like or industrial-like feeling that the building has uh, inherent within it. Um, next slide, please.
And so you can see within the uh, laboratory space, Chun alluded to the overhead service panels. You can see those uh, ceiling connections uh, providing the laboratory space with a, a high degree of flexibility. This enables, uh, as we su suggested earlier, uh, the tenants to ultimately move in and, and uh, deal with this in a certain plug and play aspect or manner that they can reconfigure the space uh, or move things around or have access to the infrastructure as needed, uh, whether that bench needs to be there or it needs to be removed for a piece of floor equipment or something of a larger scale. Uh, the overhead service obviously enables that. And as you can see from this picture, uh, that the laboratories are flooded with light. Uh, they are uh, bright and airy spaces. These are the kinds of uh, spaces that we believe uh, scientists really want to work in. Next slide, please. So again, this idea of seeing from within the laboratory, uh, you know, through uh, the, the uh, expanse of glass that we've got to try and allow for that natural light to pour into the space, into the laboratory from the office environment and, and to further that uh, visual connection between the office and the laboratory environment, which improves lab safety by encouraging the, the folks doing bench work to lead the laboratory environment for collaboration and for uh, write-up and any other tasks that are not necessarily required to be done in a wet lab environment. Next slide, please. And over here, we have an image of the air source heat pump being delivered uh, back in November to the HRC. Anthony is going to go into full detail regarding the overall design of the mechanical plant that we have at HRC. But, you know, it's $20 million that we've invested into this infrastructure, it'll be really easy for us to kind of plug and play and move in for tenants to kind of move qu really quickly. Um, you know, it'll probably speed up the, the build out by 12 months due to current lead times. And, you know, the fact that we have this infrastructure already in place and ready to tap into for our future builds. Next slide. With that, I'm going to introduce Jeff Ballerstein, who's the CFO at New York Stem Cell Foundation, who's been a tremendous partner of ours at the building and also with Taconic. Jeff? Thanks a lot, Chun. Thank you, Nancy, and your City Builds Bio. I'm happy to be here to talk about the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Um, we felt like we were little pioneers coming into the neighborhood, into the building, and we're really excited about what's happening in the building and in the neighborhood. Triumvirate was actually a big partner of ours in the beginning because we were at the uh, Audubon Biotech Center up on 166th Street under Columbia's umbrella of health, uh, environmental health and safety. And we really needed a partner to help us um, transition to having our own health and safety plans and hazardous waste removal. And, you know, thank you, Alicia. You know, triumvirate has been a great partner for us. Um, I don't know if I want to go to the next slide. So uh, we leased up in 2015 and did our build out. And I think a lot of you know that. Um, and been here now it's been a little over five years actually on site and we recently expanded to take the uh double down the building and we took the remaining part of the six, second floor that we didn't already lease which is like an additional twenty three thousand square feet that we're currently uh in the planning of our uh, expanding our existing labs um we um well, I just wanted to mention everyone, we, we had a very interesting visitor on Friday. We had the former director of the NIH, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, come visit us. He recently became uh, President Biden's chief scientific advisor. And we've had a long going collaboration with Dr. Collins and he came to visit us uh, to talk about his project, to see our labs. And he was super impressed with uh, our capabilities, uh, the infrastructure, the building, the whole, we described the whole neighborhood. He was uh, really blown away by uh, everything that's happening here. And I think um, we should all feel proud of that. Um, is there, next slide. This is the picture of our slide, which looks a little familiar to the other floors in, in the building. It's pretty consistent and you can see uh, we recently had a, a clean room that we qualified uh, to be able to do clinical grade cellular work. And we have a project in uh, macular degeneration that we're in collaboration with Columbia University to uh, actually make the cells that people lose when they have macular degeneration and get that implanted in the back of their eye. Next slide. That's it. Anything else, John? Thanks, Jeff. Um, since most of 
most of every, the folks that are uh, you know attending this panel are familiar with the project at this point. We want to kind of, we wanted to round out this discussion by uh, familiarizing the, the rest about this neighborhood that we have in Midtown West. Um, it's a live work play neighborhood, you know, for folks that you know are looking for the prestige of a Manhattan address. Your HRC anchors this neighborhood with you know life science cluster. And you know we have a neighbor directly to the east of us with Mount Sinai coming in in the next couple of years. But HRC is flanked by DeWitt Clinton Park directly south of us. And then to the west, we have the Hudson River and as well as the Hudson River Greenway, which is a tremendous amenity to the area. Um, recently, the city has invested in Pier 97, which you see highlighted just northwest of HRC. On the next slide, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about these amenities that we have shaping up this neighborhood. Um, the re city recently invested $40 million uh, in Pier 97. It's currently under construction. These are some renderings of this fantastic new park that they're putting on a pier right by HRC, just a block and a half away. It's going to be a fantastic addition to the neighborhood. Next slide. Directly south, we have a six acre oasis uh, with DeWitt Clinton Park. City has put over three and a half million dollars into this park over the last several years, resoldering the turf, adding new bench, new entrances to kind of really uh, round out this park and make it a tremendous asset. And then the, on the next slide, we'll kind of go through some of the, the residential boom that's gone, gone on over the last 10 years. Over approximately 10,000 units have been either delivered or in, are in development in this surrounding cluster by HRC. Um, including 525 West 52nd Street, which are you see images on the left-hand side of you two. You know, Taconic is a big believer in this Midtown West area. We've invested $350 million in 525 West 52nd Street. And, uh, you know, there's 500 units in that property. But, you know, it really bolsters this neighborhood as a live, work, play neighborhood where folks can kind of find everything they need, you know, just within a stone's throw. That kind of rounds out our discussion at HRC. I'll pass it over to... Uh, Michael on 125. There we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Adelstein, I'm a senior associate on the uh, commercial asset management team, and uh, really excited to be talking a bit about 125 uh, West End Avenue with everybody. Uh, I'll quickly start off by acknowledging and thanking our partners in this deal, uh, Nuveen and LaSalle uh, they've kind of shared our conviction in, in life sciences, particularly in Midtown West. And uh, we're really excited about this project because uh, it represents to us um, an important milestone in the kind of collective effort of building this industry in New York City. Uh, and once completed, uh, you know, it's currently under redevelopment right now. Um, it will represent the, the largest delivery of life science space in New York City uh, since Alexandria was completed a few years ago. Uh, so you can jump to the next slide. Go right to the back one. Jump forward a slide or two. There we go, thank you. So uh, 125 West End Avenue is a 400,000 square foot uh, building. It's going to be 100% uh, purpose built for life sciences with all the infrastructure and uh, you know, mechanicals, amenities, et cetera, going in on day one, um, once it's completed. It's located at the corner of uh, 66th Street and West End Avenue, so right just 10 blocks north of uh, 619 West 54th Street, uh, with uh, really, really large floor plates. And we'll show you some kind of renderings of what the interiors look like. Um, and this building, you know, you think a little bit about the spectrum of life science properties in New York City, 619 West 54th Street represents sort of, you know, the, the right now, you know, we're, we're ready for uh, ready move in tenants, uh, graduation tenants. Um, 125 West End Avenue is sort of the other end in, in that we're, you know, once it's completed, which was currently slated for the mid 2023, we'll be able to accept all, you know, the full spectrum of potential life science tenants, everything from, you know, incubators, as John mentioned earlier, all the way through, you know, really kind of large institutional anchor users. So really exciting uh, to kind of see, you know, who this building is filled with over the course of the next couple of years. Uh, next slide, please. So just quickly on the history here, uh, this building was completed in the 1920s. It, uh, you know, started its life as an automotive service center for the Chrysler uh, company. 
And uh, if you think about, you know, why this building, uh, you know, attracted us, or I should say why life sciences were, was so attractive um, for this building, from our perspective, it had to do with kind of the, you know, the fundamental sort of infrastructure, um, the fundamentals of the building. So really robust floor plates, really, uh, you know, wide spans, uh, wide spanning floor plates with very few columns. Um, is a really unique um, helix uh, structure that goes up to the roof of the building, which you know previously allowed cars to drive all the way up to the roof that we've sort of repurposed in an interesting way. Go to the uh, next slide, please. And this is kind of just a, a quick cross section of you know sort of illustrating some of the different features of the building that were uh, you know looking to incorporate and which will be you know ready for you know, once it's uh, constructed on day one. So. Kind of from, from the bottom up, we have a, a loading dock, a covered a private manned loading dock right off of 66th Street, which will allow full chain of custody deliveries and shipments for tenants. And there's a really kind of unique uh, roadway viaduct that goes off of uh, uh, West End Avenue uh, along the south side of the building, which will allow you know drive up access right onto the second floor. Um, you can see in the middle that the helix structure that I was referring to earlier, which I think is really, really unique uh, feature of the building um, and kind of, you know, working, working up to the top, just a couple other things to highlight. Brand new roof deck with views of the Hudson River, which will show you a rendering of. And then we have all the HVAC and mechanicals, uh, which are going in, as mentioned, you know, day one, extremely robust, um, state of the art, best in class. Uh, next slide, please. We'll just kind of quickly breeze through these. Um, so these are some interior renderings of the lab spaces, really high uh, ceiling heights up to 16 feet in certain areas, um, you know, floor to ceiling windows with an all new facade. Next slide, please. And this is a, you know, conceptual rendering of what the, the uh, helix amenity will kind of look like once potentially completed you know, if we were to combine multiple floors together, which we think uh, will tie in really nicely with all the kind of amenity offerings that we'll have throughout the rest of the building. Next slide. It's just another rendering of the helix. Next. And then you know, a brand new lobby, which uh, will connect down into the conference center. And you know, as mentioned, we're really excited for this to be kind of part of the greater life science uh, community. And so some of the renderings that will be shared shortly of the, the conference center you know, we're, we're really excited for this to be sort of the focal piece and connecting to the lobby of, of a, a place for the community to gather for events and things of that nature. Next. Here's a quick rendering of the, the rooftop with views of the Hudson. Next. And, you know, last time we shared some information about this project, I think we were just, you know, one or two months into uh, into the redevelopment program and we're now a little bit more than halfway so the curtain wall has made really substantial progress um as you can see here looking for that to be completed uh, over the course of the next couple of months and we'll be working on interior fit outs including a you know full pre-build of one of the floors um for uh you know anticipated tco which is on schedule for q2 late q2 of 2023 next and just really quickly about the the neighborhood you know the the Upper West Side goes without saying as being a, you know, a tremendous live work play neighborhood. And as John mentioned earlier, the 65th Street Traverse uh, through Central Park allows for really easy access to all the institutions, medical institutions on the east side. You know, you're two avenues over from Lincoln Center uh, where the one train is located. And then you, know, you have the, uh, the upper, sorry, the West Side Highway with access at 72nd Street, just six blocks north of here, Riverside Park. Uh, which has gone through a you know pretty significant overhaul uh, in, in the particular area that's just to uh, uh, adjacent to the building. Uh, next slide, please. You can see Lincoln Center and, and one more, please. Riverside Park South, which is uh, as mentioned, it's just just literally a half a block away from the building, has gone through over a twenty one million dollar uh, capital program, which was just completed in twenty twenty. So. Lots going on in the neighborhood, really, really vibrant and dynamic, and you know, obviously very, very excited for once this building is completed to be integrated into the greater neighborhood. So with that said, uh, jump to the next slide and we'll hand it off to Mr. Long. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, dynamic was an interesting choice of words and it's a perfect segue. 
uh, just to quick give you a heads up as to what you know the design inspiration was for this particular building. Uh, this is a building that we are talking about doing uh, some pre-built environments for as well, similar to what we just described over at uh, 619 at the Hudson Research Center. Uh, so the inspiration behind this because of the history of the building, again, we talk about this being a, a factory district or something of a, a, an M zone. This building happens to not be in an M zone. It is in a C zone, but we were able to uh, uh, appropriately uh, get this uh, approved for laboratory use. Uh, but the building's history uh, as, as a, uh, a vehicular uh, Chrysler facility was important to us. Uh, uh, the idea of momentum, the idea of the growing of this market. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, we started to take inspiration from that idea of momentum, of movement, of motion. Uh, so you start to see these elements that we brought into this building that will repeat, uh, uh, you know, visually as this connectivity to that momentum. Uh, curvilinear elements that are highlighted in the high touch material of wood, for example, in this case. Um, that highlight uh, the idea of, okay, this is where we're seeing this momentum, this motion uh, uh, physically manifested in terms of the building's design. You saw an image of the lobby before, the idea of that kind of curvilinear component around it uh, uh, and with, with its kind of you know, fractalized green walls, which in fact are, are wood walls. Um, so again, you get this idea of this wood component uh, signifying the building's uh, uh, motion uh, and, and being that kind of standout element in, in the design. Next slide, please. So here's the front door. Again, you get that kind of uh, you know metallic aesthetic that that you know lends to its history uh, of the automotive industry, but has a little bit of a you know sharp clean line element that that you'd come to expect from a life science building. Uh, a little bit more of a kind of a, a buttoned up or dressed up and tightened up facade. This is a complete overclad. This this facade uh, done so for energy purposes primarily, but also to kind of reinvent the building to you know show that the building has a second life. It's an, on another rotation of the wheel. Next slide, please. Um, this is the uh, northeast corner of the building. So this is the separate entrance. You can see in the far distance in the high side, that's the building lobby. But as you can also see, there is a ramp leading down. That ramp down leads us to uh, one of the building's amenities, a conference center uh, that has been designed for the lowest level of this building. Next slide, please. So here's an axonometric, uh, uh, a rendered axonometric. So you see the ramp on the left-hand side which again has uh, a wood cladding to it and, and gives us that momentum, that curvilinear motion uh, into the space. Uh, and then we've got that kind of central milling space. On the right-hand side of this space, you see the larger space, the uh, auditorium space that uh, can be divided into two or opened up into a single uh, larger room. Uh, and then there are some uh, ancillary rooms off of that that you can see we've got some catering components, a kitchen element uh, uh, to the space or a, uh, a, a nourish element to the space, as well as a, a boardroom uh, and, and what we call a flex boardroom. So the idea being that, you know, there's a, a little bit more of a, a loose furniture uh, arrangement in that room all the way to the left that enables us some uh, flexibility in how that space gets utilized. Next slide, please. So again, this is the view, if you will, coming down uh, underneath the lobby space into uh, the conferencing center. Again, you've got that wood uh, paneling on the left, that curvilinear element. You can kind of get a peek into the boardroom. Uh, the glass in this space for uh, uh, the sake of uh, privacy uh, is all switch glass or, or able to be uh, frosted at the uh, push of a button uh, so that we do have that privacy. So again, you're getting that kind of uh, injection of, of technology into a space that is a historically 1929 building uh, that was a cutting edge of technology at the time it was built. Next slide, please. And then you see this is that boardroom again, same idea. It's transparent unless uh, there is a meeting going on where there are desires of uh, privacy, at which point the switch glass can be engaged and that room becomes, uh, that the glass becomes clouded and the room becomes private. Um, uh, next slide, please. This is the larger room. You see it in its open configuration. We will have uh, a screen to the left as well if the room wanted to be reconfigured, uh, oriented to the left side so that you get a deeper room. Um, or you could have the two screen situation with a wall that goes right down the middle of it to divide the room in two. Again, you see these circular light elements that are reminiscent again of that motion uh, concept. Uh, next slide, please. And then we brought that up to the, to the pre-build floor. We brought that up, that idea of curvilinear, the idea of motion. Again, you see the helix space at the top of the screen here, uh, where there are these, you know, uh, what we call pods, uh, meeting pods that are uh, kind of uh, 
splayed about the entire of the helix, the central helix space. And then you've got, in this case, three tenant spaces, uh, two smaller to the le top left, top right, as well as a larger tenant to the bottom. You see the entrances to all of those tenant spaces uh, are marked by that curvilinear wall. That's where you've got your reception environment and the idea of uh, the reminiscent of the motion conversation. Next slide, please. So this is the helix, the center uh, of that helix environment. The idea of that wood being that curvilinear touch element again. Uh, you can see the stairs kind of uh, moving up around to the left uh, and then the pods in the distance beyond that. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a view up those stairs to the pods as they uh, are currently designed. You know, the idea again of expressing the structure above overhead, allowing the ramp that exists still here uh, uh, to, to show itself, which is where you get these kind of floating elements to these uh, uh, design uh, touches. Uh, the space itself, uh, the railing on the right is actually designed to handle uh, uh, an accessible lift. So the idea is that these pods are still accessible as well, uh, uh, able to be used by all the building's tenants. Uh, next slide, please. And then we get an entrance into one of the, uh, the typical uh, tenant spaces. This again, the wood element that uh, is curvilinear that gives us that signal uh, significant uh, movement or motion in the space. The ceiling element on the right-hand side is a metallic ceiling element meant to be reminiscent of the industry and the automobiles. Uh, again, the metallic wall paneling on the left-hand side with some peekaboos into the laboratory environment. Next slide. The laboratory is uh, uh, specifically, you know, with the, uh, with the curvilinear wall on the inside of the laboratory here. This is the uh, kind of uh, opposite side of that curvilinear wall. You can see some glass in the, in the, uh, distance in the background there. It's the transparency we talked about earlier at the Hudson Research Center, some uh, uh, appeal of transparency here uh, that was reminiscent of, of, of the brand that has been created at the other location. Next slide, please. And so here you can kind of see in, in the office environment, uh, that kind of collection of uh, collaborative space here to our right and, and, and in the foreground, uh, a pantry space uh, in the background, uh, you see that sort of industrial feel, the open ceiling environment with dependent fixtures. Uh, and then to the right, you see the glass and the transparency into the laboratory environment so that the space between the office environment and the laboratory environment becomes that collaborative environment. Next slide, please. Another view, basically, we're looking back to the left here at the entrance as we come through to immediate left of us is the pantry space. To the right of us is the open office environment. And you can see the, the transparency between uh, the office environment and the laboratory environment. Next slide. Anthony, take it away. Good, thanks, Matt. So my name is Anthony Montalto. I'm a partner at JBNB. Uh, we are the engineers, the MEP engineers responsible for the Hudson Research Center and 125 West End Avenue. Uh, before I walk you through the approach the design team at Taconic went through for Hudson Research Center and 125 from a sustainability and carbon emission reduction standpoint, I thought it'd be important to first walk you through how we got here from a legislation standpoint. Next slide. So we are an important moment in time in the city in regard to building design. Energy codes have continued to push the design and construction community to more energy efficient and sustainable design. And now we've been faced with new local laws that are pushing toward decarbonization of buildings in New York City. Local law 97, which provides carbon emission caps on existing and new buildings. And the latest local law that was adopted at the end of 2021 is local law 154, which phases out fossil fuel burning in new construction. Next slide. So this is a snapshot of the loads we would typically see in these type of facilities, laboratory and healthcare. The bottom part of the building represents the loads which are powered by the incoming electrical service. And we know at this point, the electrical grid serving New York City is pretty dirty. The top part of the building is an image that represents the heating loads for the building, which typically have been provided via fossil fuel burning source like boilers. Next slide. So where do we need to head in the future? We need to move away from boilers to air source heat pumps, which utilizes electricity and outdoor air to provide heating to these buildings. And the second piece is, which is mostly critical for New York State's plan, is to bring on board more renewable energy sources to green the electrical grid through wind and solar farms. Next slide. So the building of the future will have less carbon emissions as compared to a typical commercial building in New York City. And the key is the future is here now. So let me explain what we did for these two projects. Next slide. Taconic and the design team were committed to staying ahead of these local laws and reducing carbon emissions for both properties. 
we had approached each of these projects with this, this uh, three-step process. First, we need to reduce the loads as much as possible. Then we would recycle and capture the waste heat before it leaves the building. Then lastly, we would electrify the heating systems. Next slide. Both Taconic buildings utilize uh, DOAS technology, which stands for Dedicated Outside Air Supply. By utilizing this strategy, we were able to reduce fan energy and cooling and heat loads within the building. Next slide. So we know labs consume two to three X the power as compared to a typical office occupancy. So capturing that waste energy from the lab facility is so critical. So specifically for West End Avenue, we captured it through the use of cooling towers and as well as the lab spill air that was leaving through louvers. Next slide. And as you can see, we took that waste energy that was supposed to go out through the cooling towers, that plume you typically see at the top of buildings, and we put it back into the building to actually heat the lab heating systems through the reheat systems and perimeter heating systems. Next slide. The amount of energy recovered from the 125 West End Avenue building was approximately 43% of the heating load needed for peak heating needs. So in conjunction with that, as well as the energy recovery in the heat wheels, we recovered a tremendous amount of energy and put that back into the heating systems. Last slide. So the crown jewel here, as Chun talked about before, and something we're all very proud of at the HRC, um, this is the delivery of the air source heat pump. The air source heat pump will provide hot water to the laboratory and support office spaces. This is the first large scale air source heat pump installation in New York City to date. It's been a pleasure working with this team that was so focused on delivering class A life science space, all while keeping sustainability at the forefront of the design decisions. These two buildings very much aligns with New York City and New York State's goals to reduce carbon emission for buildings. I'm gonna pass it on to Matt to finish up. I think that was it for our projects. I know we got others to get to and we can probably push questions towards uh, towards the end. So Carolina, I think if you wanna jump ahead, we're ready to get into the next, next team. Go ahead, Carolina, we can, we can jump to the next project. Thanks. So thanks, Matt, Michael and Chun uh, and Jeff and all of your team for that amazing presentation of what's going on uh, in your buildings. Just beautiful from a design perspective and obviously from a technical perspective, uh, really cutting edge as well. So great additions to our life science inventory. Now I'd like to introduce 787 11th Avenue, um, which is being developed by Georgetown Company in Mount Sinai. And we're going to hear from Stephen Dietz from Mitchell Gergiola Architects and Thomas Ahn, the real estate uh, department of Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai. Thanks, Nancy. Um, it's uh, Stephen is here. And I think Tom was unable to come at the last minute. Am, am I correct about that, Tom? Are you on? You guys are all hearing me, correct? Yes. We hear you. Great. So um, unfortunately, Tom wasn't able to make it, but um, I will run through his slides as well as mine. And um, again, I'm with Mitchell Jergal Architects Partner, and we've been working with Mount Sinai for the last three years. Um, and in the context of what we've just seen, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, what we've just kind of looked through is all the sort of uh, excitement about building the right type of space with the thought that the right actual client will show up and start using it. And um, we did see a couple of clients in there. Um, but I think in the context of what we've just seen, what's interesting is Mount Sinai is taking an enormous amount of space um, compared to some of the other folks we've kind of reviewed today. Um, it's a total of uh, over 120,000 square feet. And um, what comes out of that is sort of a different level of challenges, I'd say, particularly from an MEP standpoint, I thought it was interesting that you guys ended on the MEP issue because it is a huge one when you start to 
uh, put in 120,000 square feet of research and clinical space. So if you go to the next slide, Um, we are at 787 11th Avenue, and as Nancy mentioned, um, the Georgetown Company developed the building and, and added the two floors on top, you can see there, uh, in glass. Uh, Mount Sinai has taken to date the top three floors of the old building, the uh, limestone-clad building. Um, so that's where they have located themselves, and it's an enormous amount of space, uh, 40,000 square feet foot plates, um, all three floors being taken. There is one floor that has a double height space that makes it a bit smaller, um, but there's, you know, really making a substantial um, presence uh, known at this location. Next. Um, we've already talked a bunch about the neighborhood. We are, 787 is right um, sort of to the east of the um, West 45th Street building. Uh, Taconic was speaking about. And, you know, from the Mount Sinai perspective, it's just a great location, not far at all from the Mount Sinai West Hospital building. Um, they've got additional offices on West uh, 57th Street. They're in the neighborhood and, you know, expanding their footprint in this area is just becoming uh, a, a sort of an inevitability. Next. Uh, I think people have talked enough about the neighborhood itself really becoming dynamic and interesting. Next. And similar to the project up at 125 West End Avenue, it was uh, the building we're talking about was uh, built in 1927 uh, for the Packard Motor Company. It's funny that we're running into these buildings uh, in this presentation, all you know, as well as in this area. Um, also has a helix. Um, the helix is, in our case, um, not being addressed as a, uh, an opportunity more often we're looking at getting rid of it um, to rec reclaim space, um, uh, but a very similar building type to 125 East West End Avenue. Um, next. And one of the things that Mount Sinai uh, recognized immediately is it just is great space potential for what they're looking to do. Um, as, as others have uh, uh, you know alluded to in this presentation, column spacing at 30 by 30 is incredibly useful for lab space. Um, we had high floor to floor, particularly on this eighth floor, which is what you're looking at right here. You know, great sunlight views, um, deeper floor plates, which allows for a lot of contiguous space, 40,000 square foot floor plates, you know, very nice. <clears throat> and the base building uh, infrastructure had been recently upgraded. We, though, when we walked in, had to do a bunch more. And I think that's one of the interesting things I think a lot of people are going to have to are going to run into as they, you know, really claim lots of space in these uh, life science spaces. Next. So what did they, um, what did Mount Sinai look to put in there? Um, it was actually a combination program. Um, on the right is the, my, what I've been working on, Mitchell Jargola, Mount Sinai Icon School of Medicine brought over neuro research, a bunch of research, research cores, including genomics and stem cell mass spectrometry, CRISPR, a cancer research, element and a, and a fully operational vivarium, which, you know, some very challenging space types with lots of exhaust and lots of uh, humidity requirements, etc. cetera. Um, additionally, they took one floor to um, put some clinical practice in there as well, breast center, spine center, and there's an ambulatory surgery center. And, and actually NK Architects has been working on that portion of the program. Uh, next. You know, so this diagram kind of summarizes what everybody else has been talking about, which is, you know, we go to these old buildings and say, well, what are we looking at? What makes these things useful for life sciences? And I think people have already talked about all the elements on the page, but I just wanted to highlight what I found um, similar to what Anthony was discussing with the MEP. Uh, power, power, and more power is needed. It's really challenging, you, and you got to get Con Ed to help you. And it has everything to do with, as Anthony mentioned, local law 97 and 154. Um, the building was set up for a certain amount of life science expectation. But when Mount Sinai showed up and said, I want to do 120,000 square feet of it, we actually had to, to develop our own central plant uh, you know, dedicated to this new research space and the amount of power required to have an, a fully electrified plant um, it's just a, ch a real challenge out there. And I'm kind of intrigued to see what happens over the years as everyone tries to draw off the grid. Next. Um, here's our section um, of the building overall. Um, 
their eighth floor became sort of the primary research level. Clinical ended up on seven, and then we've got some more research space on six, and the ambulatory surgery center is also on six. They took a portion of the building that has a double height space that had been carved out by a previous tenant. Um, they love that because they got so much MEP to, to put over the top of these uh, surgical rooms. They just needed the extra space. And on the far left, you can just kind of get a feel for the numbers of what we're adding to the neighborhood. 160,000 rentable total square feet being ad added. We count 255. 254 total people, wet and dry lab being added, 30 primary investigators, 170 lab benches, and a 4,000 uh, uh, small animal cage vivarium. I mean, this is a substantial addition to the neighborhood and hearing what else is going on there, it's just gonna be very interesting to see how um, all of this develops uh, in the area. Next. Here's the eighth floor um, that is being built out as we speak. I was just walking there today. Um, one interesting thing when I was looking at the um, plans that Taconic was presenting, I think you can see the balance of lab to lab support is substantially different than what they're sort of predicting over there. And I, it's something to think about, um, Taconic, from your perspective. Um, look how you can see the open lab along the edge of our building um, required nearly as much lab support space um, to really make that work. And, uh, you know, offices as well, obviously. And then the vivarium, you can kind of get a feel for how proportionally large that is relative to the, the total size of the of the footprint we've been uh, developing. Next. And um, this is just a quick plan view of the same. You can go to the next. Here's that large lab along the edge of the building. You know, we're excited about this space. I think a lot of what uh, the gentleman from Perkins and Will discussed were discussed with the users themselves as well. They wanted to be out at the edge of the building as much light and air as they could get. And what's enjoyable is they sort of embrace the idea of a, of a flexible, changeable lab over time. So it's not dedicated to one particular person. Um, but you know, the 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 the, the PIs may shift um, the number of lab benches they use over time. And again, you can see a kind of a boring part of the drawing just behind that open lab space all the lab support that went into um, really developing to make these spaces work. Next. Um, a section through that same lab, we have wet benches right down the center. Um, the, this is showing the reception area that takes you from the ele elevator lobby into that um, wet bench area. And then, you know, typical layout for lab in life sciences, you need the wet bench, but you also need the write-up desks. And we sort of ended up with those um, by the window, but you get a feel for proportion here and the kinds of things that, you know, make these things real. Next. This is a shot from this morning. Uh, that's the large lab um, area that's going to be become the large open lab space. Uh, they just got the floors done this morning, uh, or sorry, the last month or so uh, with leveling. Next. Uh, shot of reception, you can keep going. And you know, I, th I think this may or may not come up over time with others. And uh, but relative to Mount Sinai, now that they have taken those um, three uh, floors on that on the old building, the top of the old building, um, you know, G the Georgetown Company was able to offer them some street presence, which I I think will become an issue over time for a variety of people. And um, you know, uh, our potential tenants. Uh, so we have a small entrance just adjacent to the right of the 787 main entrance. Next. We're able to carve out, you know, sort of a 30 foot wide bay, um, separate entrance kind of marquee. Um, in this case, we kind of mimic the existing entrance directly adjacent to it with um, just a, a bit of a vest vestibule and, and the ability to go in. And it became important for Mount Sinai because they do have uh, on that seventh floor clinical patients um, who don't, you know, or who need some assistance getting getting to those floors. Next. And just a couple last shots on the right there is our beautiful lobby shaping up with a fire protection system running through the middle of it at the moment. Um, but it's coming along and uh, the, the clinical piece should be open by August of this year. And the, um, the labs are going to be, we're aiming for March, I guess a year from today. And that's it. Terrific. Thank you, Stephen. That was a wonderful overview. And I think we can all really see the vibrancy that's emerging in Midtown West. It's just amazing. 
Um, so now we're going to turn and go across the city uh, to Long Island City. Uh, and Bill Harvey's going to tell us what's going on there. Uh, thanks very much, Nancy. And thanks um, to the folks at uh, Triumvirate for hosting us. Um, Carolina, next slide, please. I'm gonna I'm gonna breeze through this deck. I'm I'm just I'm looking at the clock and I see that we only have about 20 minutes left and I, I don't want to um, take up all the time. I know I know Rob and Liz are gonna be speaking as well. This um, this deck um, is part of a tenant deck that um, that we do for our clients. Um, the uh, the page that uh, that you're looking at right now just gives a brief history of um, life science development in New York City. Um, I should emphasize that there's been a lot of activity in the last four or five years. Next slide, please. Uh, actually, just go back one. Thanks. Um, this is this speaks to um, some of the uh, the other uh, market information. We've got some info on tenants. We've got some info on on rents. Um, in the lower right hand corner, there's some great information on um, government, both city and state incentives um, to that have really uh, spurred the cluster. Um, very, very important to where we are today. Next deck, or uh, next slide. This is also um, something that a lot of our tenants have found very helpful. Um, just a kind of a bullet on the ingredients that are kind of important to uh, tenants, both from a locational perspective, but also physical. Um, on the location side, cost is obviously very, very important, especially when we're talking about young startup companies, a vibrant urban neighborhood. Um, you want your location to be um, seen as uh, attractive to a young, sophisticated, very well-educated workforce, access to mass transit, um, proximity to institutional resources. The cluster concept um, is very, very important here. Um, you know, Liz can probably uh, speak to a lot of these locational elements. So I'll <coughs> leave it at that for, for her. Um, on the physical side, Matt uh, and some of the others have talked about um, some of the key ingredients that, that go into making these conversion projects so successful. And, and you see those kind of enumerated on the right-hand side. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna fly through this one as well because I don't want to uh, steal Rob's thunder. Um, Newmark is very proud to be the, the, the building agent for uh, Inolabs. Um, Inolabs is uh, King Street Properties' first project in, in New York City. It's a 267,000 square foot project. It's a, uh, a conversion of an older, um, industrial building, um, six, six stories. We have um, ten, a, a tenant on its open trons is the uh, tenant on the second and third floor. Um, have a great amenity space in here. And again, I'm gonna let Rob really speak to what's happening at Inolabs in greater depth. Next slide, please. This is the Alexandria Center in, in, Long, in uh, Long Island City. It's about 180,000 square feet, um, three stories. Alexandria's done a very nice job of um, creating spaces for smaller tenants. Um, I would almost say that Alexandria is, is unique in that they have um, spaces that are available to tenants sub 10,000 square feet. Um, one of their, their um, challenges, I think, is that they're on the, the opposite side of the tracks from where Inolabs and some of the other developments are. I think that this is gonna be very successful for them in the, the long term. They also have a site um, adjacent to this property. Um, it's a, a development site about 150,000 square feet. So all told about 330,000 square feet between the two sites. Next slide, please. See uh, the uh, Paragon Oil Building. Um, we've kind of put an asterisk next to this site um, as part of the, the evolving Long Island City life science cluster. Um, the owners here, related companies, 
uh, together with uh, Green Oak, have pivoted recently to to life science. This has been a um, redevelopment project for about the last like three four years. Um, they've really failed at um, at gaining any office tenants. So with all the activity in life science, um, they've kind of pivoted to to uh, biotech quite recently. Um, the challenge here is that um, it's it's right on top of the the other uh, seven train on the uh, the Hunters Point line, but just not a lot of neighborhood amenities in this area. Next slide, please. Court Square Labs. So this is uh, Longfellow's project. Longfellow um, and Columbia Property Trust are going to redevelop this property. This is actually um, about a five minute walk from Inolabs. Um, great building. This will deliver in about 15 months. Um, 21,000 square foot plates. Um, Longfellow, similar to King Street, a, um, a developer of great renown in, in Boston. This is um, really one of their first projects in, um, in New York City. They're also developing the New York Blood Center campus um, in Manhattan. Next slide. 2302 49th Avenue. This is um, this is a joint venture between um, Nanfung Life Science Real Estate and the Innovo Property Group. It's about a um, two, three minute walk from the Paragon building. The New York City Housing Authority is the um, predominant tenant in the building. They're on the lower four floors. They have about 400,000 square feet. Nanfung and IPG are gonna develop redevelop the top two floors of the building, each floor about 100,000 square feet into premium life science space. They are talking about um, proactively bringing in a, a, a vivarium operator as a kind of a magnet for other tenants in the building. Next slide. 2402 Queens Plaza South. Um, again, I don't wanna steal too much of Rob's thunder here, um, 2402 is a joint venture between King Street Properties and Botanic. Um, this project will develop in about two, uh, I'm sorry, it will deliver in about two and a half years from now. Um, 260,000 square feet, typical floor size about 30,000 square feet. This site is actually right on Queens Plaza South, right at the foot of the 59th Street Bridge and right across the East River from um, a number of major academic and medical institutions. Um, it'll be a nice um, bookend to what King Street is doing right now at, at Inolabs. Next. Let me uh, shift it over to, to Rob and to Liz now. I think I go next, is that right? <laughs> yes, okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Bill, for that great roundup. Thank you, Nancy, for this opportunity to talk about Long Island City. Thank you to Triumvirate for sponsoring today. And thank you, special thank you to Bill, Rob, Ed, and many of you who are on this uh, uh, Zoom for all you're doing to make Long Island City successful, both in general and also as a life science cluster. Next slide. So just very quickly, the Long Island City Partnership is the local development corporation for Long Island City. We've been that for over 40 years. We do everything from one-on-one -on -one business assistance, on-street services, marketing, et cetera, but also uh, sometimes economic development planning. Next slide. So we released in 2016, a comprehensive plan looking at Long Island City. And one of the things identified was the potential for Life science, we followed on in 2018 with a study specifically of life sciences in Long Island City, looking, uh, talking to decision makers in life sciences, a number of you on the Zoom today, um, to ask the question, you know, it's been talked about, why hasn't it happened? Should it happen? Could it happen? And the resounding answer was that Long Island City has to become a key part of the New York City emerging cluster for the overall cluster to succeed. 
Um, we talked at the time we did the report, there were four incubators in development. Now there's six and more coming. Uh, people were literally losing sleep about where all these companies going to go. And um, uh, by the way, I should also mention the board president's um, tech zone report for Western Queens. But the basic message that we got back was that Long Island City had all the key elements that are needed for a life science company to be successful here and to locate here talent workforce transportation cluster quality of life real estate incentives uh, bill touched on some of these things but also really great price point and centrally located um, next please so a little bit about long island city and i'm going to cram a lot onto this one slide uh, but this is basically, you know, as the, as the name indicates, Long Island City, while a neighborhood of New York City, is essentially a city within New York City. It's enormous. It's over three square miles. It has been uh, the fastest growing residential neighborhood for a few years. It held that title in the country. Um, we have a unique mix of residents right here, everything from gleaming penthouses, a uh, beautiful waterfront, both affordable housing and market rate to the largest public housing development in the country. And all of this gives you um, a great talent pool right here, as well as great places for your folks to live. Um, but we also are, um, as I'll talk a little more, more on another slide, um, incredibly well, uh, our transit environment is just unparalleled. Um, there's eight subway lines, multiple buses, ferries, et cetera, et cetera, which gives you access to the talent everywhere, but also anything you want to do. And again, we'll, um, uh, uh, sorry, I meant to talk about something. We just go back a slide for a second, because uh, this is the one slide where I have all the different clusters. So um, sorry, we've been uh, doing a bunch of different Zooms lately, but I just want to point out that, that the, the subway lines, which are indicated here, as well as the Long Island Railroad, which comes right through, gives you a one seat connection to pretty much every of the sub clusters, um, uh, one or two seat connection in the New York area. Um, and I personally have gotten on the train here and been down at the Genome Center in 15 minutes. So uh, incredible connectivity that's specifically related to life sciences, um, as well as the ferries, which, for example, can get you down to NYU. Um, and now that there's the uh, Second Avenue subway, the subways can also get you very well to the northern part of the East Side Medical Corridor as well. But just going back to that slide, thanks, Carolina. Um, uh, so, you know, in this very rich live, work, innovate, create, and just frankly have a good time um, neighborhood. So uh, we've got a, a unique mix of businesses. This is the most productive area in New York State still, but also home to just an incredible variety. I mean, it's a huge home of film and television, home of life sciences, advanced manufacturing, the food industry is incredible here. The beer industry, we have more breweries per capita than any part of the city. Um, and, a, you know, wonderful, really unique local retail, but also great chains like Trader Joe's have now moved in. Educational institutions, LaGuardia Community College is right smack in the middle of Long Island City, which has a lot of programs that are training people to be lab techs and other kinds of um, uh, skills that would support life science development but we also are right across from Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island. And as you'll see, uh, again, connected to all the major institutions around. Got a lot of great high schools, great um, schools for your, your own kids to go to um, from K through 12 and so on. Arts and culture, uh, this would be a, a cultural destination city all on its own, over 40 institutions from uh, world renowned uh, places like MoMA PS1 to incredibly uh, cutting edge places like the Flux Factory um, and a million working artists and and lots of public art as well, some of which we've put out. Um, great parks on the waterfront, really world class uh, waterfront park, huge, gorgeous, fantastic, but also playgrounds and the other kind of little pocket parks that you need to just get a breath of fresh air and have a good conversation. And similarly, food and drink, it just keeps getting bigger and better. Uh, everything from very quirky, you know, global street food to Michelin starred um, uh, Mexican restaurants and uh, the food and drink is, is being spread even more fully throughout the neighborhood into areas that previously were a bit um, retail starved. 
Um, this mix, by the way, allowed us, frankly, to stay pretty healthy during, uh, sorry about the pun, uh, during COVID as a neighborhood. Um, there was always some activity. You know, we have the, the New York City's only homegrown airline, uh, uh, JetBlue here and others. We never completely shut down on the business side and we never completely shut down on the residential side. So there was always, has always been some life and activity. And in fact, a lot of buildings opened up during COVID. Uh, so we enhanced our retail environment and amenities, even as we um, tried to make it through this, you know, terrible situation that we've all been weathering. Next, Long Island City is the nation's, next slide, uh, the nation's uh, longest continuously active uh, innovation district. Uh, nice fact, a little mention there. And we've um, maintained that character um, throughout the centuries now. Next, please. So I was talking a little bit about access before. Um, I think it's, um, we are literally the geographic center of New York. We are five minutes from Midtown because of the multiple subways and ferries and bridges and tunnels. You can pick your access point and be there very quickly. But we're also 15 minutes from LaGuardia Airport and 25 minutes from JFK, giving you access to the region, the nation, the world. Um, Long Island Railroad comes through here and we're just a hop, skip and a jump from Grand Central and Port Authority. So uh, pretty much everyone, everybody on, on Matt's uh, and Nancy's <laughs> um, cluster maps you can get to from here. Uh, and in fact, we do see already, you know, uh, employer employees from uh, the New Jersey Life Science Corridor coming to Long Island City to work in companies here. So on the left here, you see that the, the transit shed um, for commuters is really, you get all of the um, great institutions, you know, the, the, the institutions, but also the graduates and the, the different suburbs are, are, are connected into this um, wonderful community uh, here. Um, next, please. So why has all this been going on here? Uh, uh, sorry, I was explaining some of why, you know, this location, location, location. Uh, over the last 10 years, this has meant just incredible growth. This, these pictures are already out of date. And um, this just shows you the core of Long Island City, looking from our rooftop farm over uh, on the other side of the Sunnyside Yards. But the, the waterfront has is, is been incredibly developing on the left. Is the develop you can see all the different little dots for different um, developments, both ground up and refurbishment of great space, a lot of it for life science and advanced manufacturing kind of uses. Next, please. These statistics show, you know, it, it, how many uh, square feet have been added and so on, and just this huge growth. I mentioned we were the fastest growing residential in, uh, in the country for a while. It's still happening. Our population has grown at, used to say more than three times, but it's closer to more than six times with the new census figures. The, over, the population in New York City, uh, jobs have, have also grown at more than twice the rate of the city. Um, next, and just to point out here, the tremendous growth in retail that's also underway, uh, adding further to our amenities um, in the area. Next, please. When we did our study in 2018, we were looking at these key factors that were mentioned and Long Island City definitely checked off uh, all the key um, boxes except for two. One was perception, and I think that's been changing a bit as you see uh, the, the, the um, projects and the companies growing and coming in here. Uh, the other was AMI presence. And it was funny because we talked to a lot of people who said that they actually thought that that was an asset. We're kind of like Switzerland. Um, whatever AMI you're associated with, um, you can get there uh, from Long Island City and you can be here. You're not stepping into anybody else's backyard. So um, we, we, are, we are in the Switzerland. I don't know that we launder money, but we are this, the, the Switzerland of the life science world. Next. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this slide is, of course, old as from 2018 and a lot of things are out of date, but the key thing was that what we saw in this study uh, was that um, there were analogous areas to Long Island City in the more mature clusters like up in Boston, um, Philly and elsewhere where you had um, the, the sort of traditional cluster, but then you had a, a very dynamic fast growing cluster like the Boston Seaport or Philadelphia Navy Yard where the spin out companies and others were going because it had the characteristics, but also the price point. So, you know, the, 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 the number here from Manhattan as um, 
as um, uh, Bill was saying, you know, you're really looking, you get about a 40% discount in uh, Long Island City potentially on space, which is a which is a great thing if you are uh, early stage and growing in particular. Um, lastly, uh, last slide, next slide. Um, so, you know, uh, Bill ran through a lot of the different um, projects that are happening here. I didn't list all of them. Uh, I think it's amazing that when around the same time as we came out with our study, immediate validation from Alexandria and King Street, two of the, the best names in the business. Um, and uh, really excited that Longfellow is here now as well, um, as well as the other uh, projects and very excited at the companies that are that are moving in. Um, again, Bill mentioned a lot of them. Uh, 3D Bio was actually here before any of these new developments. Uh, they are pioneering printing uh, 3D printing tissue, uh, which is uh, very exciting. Um, so, you know, it's coming together. We've blown through in our study the case one and case two uh, scenarios. And I think that we're just going to keep seeing Long Island City emerging more and more as a key part of the overall New York City cluster. Last slide. So lastly, uh, a lot of facts and figures out here and a lot of a uh, uh, lot more to share with you all. And it's all packaged very nicely on our website on the industry spotlight for life sciences, but you can also explore Long, Long Island City there uh, and learn a lot more about the neighborhood and things that I showed you if you go. So LICQNS.com is your uh, portal to all this and more. And I look forward to um, hopefully meeting many of you in Long Island City in the near future. Wow, exciting stuff, that's for sure. Uh, Bill, you wanna introduce Rob? Yeah, so um, just a, a, a quick introduction. I, I first met uh, Rob Albro about five years ago. Um, and um, Rob is the chief investment officer now at King Street Properties. Uh, back when I knew him, I think he was a mere managing director at KSP. Um, Rob was down here two or three days a week uh, for a good two, three years um, looking at sites. We had the opportunity of introducing him to GFP Real Estate, which is his partner um, at Inolabs. Um, I don't talk to Rob as often as I used to, but he's a great guy and um, he's had real, um, shown real leadership for the development of the life science cluster, specifically in Long Island City, but I, I would also say generally in New York City. Rob. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, good to see you and thanks again for putting this all together. I'll, I'll be very short. I know we're out of time and frankly, I actually have another call I need to jump to with myself. Um, but I think, you know, Liz, Liz and Bill have been hugely influential in our uh, experience in New York City and especially Long Island City. We're a little bit unique. We're solely focused on life science. Um, we're based up here in Boston. We have projects in Boston, New York, Raleigh, and a couple of projects out in the Bay Area uh, now. But we kind of looked at New York for the completely blank slate. We didn't own anything in New York. We weren't trying to convert anything that we owned and try to... Um, you know, so we kind of were agnostic to location and we picked Long Island City, uh, frankly, over anywhere, given all the attributes that that Liz talked about. I know Bill has talked about a few of them, but we love the um, proximity to all the amenities, all the the uh, changes that are happening in Long Island City, very, very well connected to both Penn Station and Grand Central uh, and, you know, close to, to all the, the different uh, nodes. So as Bill said, we have two projects. Uh, our first project delivered in uh, the fourth quarter. Uh, we have Open Trons uh, that is leasing two floors. They've been a great tenant, obviously playing a big part in the uh, pandemic response and that uh, component of what's going on in New York City. And we have great activity on the rest of the building. Um, you know, we've built a purpose-built lab building in New York, um, which was, you know, hadn't been done since Alex Alexandria Center. Obviously, there's some other great projects here. Um, and, and we're speaking with our, our, uh, our money, I'll say, by uh, doubling down with botanic properties on a second project in Long Island City to deliver behind this. So we're really, really excited about the prospects. Um, it's been obviously, a, as Bill said, it's been five plus years of, of putting in the putting everything together from our side. 
we know there are many more, uh, many folks that have been played a big, big part in this, but we're starting to see a lot of momentum from our perspective uh, on the tenant side and uh, very, very optimistic about, you know, our projects and where life science is headed in Long Island City in general. So uh, again, short, I'll be short here, but again, we're, we're very excited to be in New York now. We've been down there for a while. Um, you know, we think that it's a, a growing node and there's many, many reasons that, that New York is gonna grow as a whole. And uh, we think Long Island City is gonna be a very, very substantial part of that uh, going forward. Thanks so much, Rob, and congratulations for your foresight uh, with respect to Long Island City. Bill and I had been debating that for a long time, uh, and I just visited your facility two weeks ago um, in the built uh, condition that it's in, and it's beautiful. Um, and I was so excited by the neighborhood and the bar down the street, and um, it was just a, a great experience to be there. So I'm looking forward to hosting an in-person event there uh, very soon so that the community can actually see what you built there. Yeah, no, we're excited. We're, we're, uh, we're excited to open the doors and hopefully see people uh, not on Zoom. Yeah, exactly. Well, listen, I know that it's late, um, but I want to thank all of our speakers today for participating. Matt, we did have um, one question uh, before we jump that I wonder if you could address. Uh, and that was um, asking rents for Hudson Research Center in 126 West End and assumption for length of term for pre-built space. Uh, can you share some light on that? Wow, we don't usually get into rents and uh, lease terms <laughs> on these calls. Um, at HRC, asking rents have pushed um, to just north of uh, $100 a foot. And 125 is, um, given that it's new and, and everything that's going into that, uh, also delivering next year, um, those are asking rents of 125. Lease terms we're flexible on when it comes to our uh, pre-built units. We understand that uh, these tenants are growing fast and may need some flexibility there. And with anchor tenants, it's, um, you know, we'd expect longer term there. That's, but happy to have any and all discussions on uh, things of that nature. That's terrific. I mean, honestly, thank you. I think that uh, New York is competitive with Cambridge now on those numbers. So um, puts us in a really good spot uh, to attract companies from the Cambridge, Boston area where there is um, tight space and, uh, you know, labor shortages at the moment. Does anyone else have any questions? I hear, I see a lot of well done. I think everybody really appreciated the information that was presented here. Even though it's late, we will drop into discussion sessions if anybody has time to stay. And again, thank you to all of our speakers and and our sponsors for uh, for sponsoring and for participating. Thank you all.